today I wanted to kind of dive in with one of my articles that I pulled. I know we've talked about these communities in the past, but I thought I'd, it'd be kind of cool to just provide additional context and really just give better clarification as to what build to rent properties or build to rent communities are. Obviously, they've been extremely popular across the country. Um, I think it here it actually references that uh, the build to rent mark housing market is not just on the rise, it's skyrocketing. 2023, there were more than 27,000 built to rent homes built up 75% from 2022 and 300% from 2020, not 2019. Again, it's it's becoming much more wow. of a trend in markets all across the country. So in this article, it kind of highlights what exactly is uh, built to rent housing. So it's, it differs slightly from single family home uh, rentals in that oftentimes with single family home rentals, they're located not necessarily all one, in one place, although they can be typically with you know single family home portfolios, they're kind of spread across the city oftentimes, whereas these built to rent communities are literally designed to be rentals for people who are wanting to rent houses and have more space than an apartment. And they usually come along with a variety of different types of amenities. So they'll have the, the swimming pools, the it's kind of it kind of replicates like a gated community uh, that has a bunch of different types of amenities. So it's it's kind of call it an apartment, but also you have more space uh, for your growing family, and you also have the access to all the different amenities that an apartment building would be. The reason why a lot of these communities are so appealing is because it gives people flexibility to be able to operate or, or rent a space, have more space available to them as opposed to an apartment, uh, but yet they don't have to worry about, you know, getting in, into a mortgage for 30 years. It kind of restricts their ability to some sometimes move depending on their ability to turn uh, to sell the home, let's let's say. Uh, so it gives people more flexibility than they're typically used to in, you know, in a, in a, in a mortgage scenario. And then on the apartment side, it obviously gives you a lot more space uh, to work with. Now, one of the biggest challenges that we're seeing on the, the build to rent community side, really across the country, is just the cost to be able to develop these communities. Now, because they're build to rent communities, developers for build to rent communities often can pay more than single family home developers because they're obviously holding the property for a longer period of time and their their yield over that period of time is going to be better than a, a residential home builder like a Pulte or whoever else that needs to be able to buy the dirt at a pretty cheap price to be able to then sell it to an end user um, and and maintain their margins. So, you know, there's definitely some benefits to pursuing builder rent developments. Obviously, there's a lot of developers out there that are starting to focus in that. I, I think we talked about one time on the podcast that we've had a couple builder rent developers scoping out land sites here in Louisville. One of my colleagues is actually working with one right now that that's looking for uh, some some dirt to build on. Um, and again, the economics uh, tend to make sense. So thought I'd just kind of open it up to, to you to kind of share some insights. If you've seen any of those in your market. I'm not sure if in Miami, you're, you're starting to see more of these communities popping up. Yeah, I was curious actually if you could scroll up and try to see where these communities are most commonly uh, located. You know, yeah, located. I don't believe this one was kind of like an like an explainer type of um, sure. let me see if I can pull it up. Yeah, I would just be curious where this is super common because first off, like I, I love the concept. I do believe we are going towards a renter nation. I am pretty bullish on that. I do believe that that is, you know, without a doubt, the, the uh, overall trend that we are headed towards. I do believe that build to rent uh, single family homes are a fantastic option for um, individuals who have a little bit more capital who do not want to spend the money specifically on buying a home. Maybe they're not, you know, traditional home buyers, right? They don't have that kind of mindset that they want to own, um, but they have some more money than the traditional, you know, apartment type of tenant. Um, and they want a little bit nicer of a place. I mean, thank you for pulling this up. You know, see, uh, I'm just reading from top to bottom. So Columbus, Ohio, Nashville, Tennessee, Salt Lake City, Utah, Orlando, Tampa, Jacksonville, Florida, Austin, Texas, San Antonio, Texas, Atlanta, Charlotte, Huntsville, Houston, Dallas, and Phoenix. Very interesting in the sense, like, I I'm curious because, like, Denver is, like, shocking to me only because, like, some of these areas, like, you know, these builder rent communities, I'm imagining they would be in probably – lower market lower price markets right like overall mm -hmm. lower price markets but i also do believe there's probably some value even doing it in the uh because the, what i'm realizing is i think they're doing the lower price markets because it just makes way too much sense to just sell them off you know in higher priced areas where you know you're gonna make too much of a profit just to sell it versus keeping it as a rental but i am curious to see what some of these margins look like i mean obviously in these types of situations um, you're probably going to get substantially better rent where, you know, if you get a three bedroom house versus a three bedroom apartment, you're probably looking at somewhere between 25 to 50 plus percent in increased rent 
on a monthly basis. Plus, you're going to have a lot less frustration because typically, like the they have a little bit more feeling of ownership when they're in you know a single family house versus an apartment. Almost every single time, 100% of the utilities are handled by the tenant. So it's also another positive for the uh, investor. You know, you're going to have a lot less probably utility costs there. So yeah, a lot of pros for sure. I think this is definitely where things are going. Also, you know, if you look at where, you, you know, all those, no, you're fine, you're fine. Um, if you look at all those main markets, uh, the other thing that I was, was um, picking up from that was those are areas with a lot of land for yeah, development. That, that's have, a big one. You sure. need to obviously have substantially more land. And so it's in, you know, a little bit lower priced markets, seemingly, at least where the, the uh, it seems like a large majority of them are, a little bit lower priced markets. And then in areas with a lot of, you know, rural land that they could develop, um, obviously, and also areas where there's a lot of people moving to it, you know, will be helpful. Yeah. Like, obviously, because like, you're not going to see it in, in, in uh, Miami-Dade County. You're just not going to see it out here. I think it would be a fantastic option, but there's just no development opportunities. There's been, you know, all, almost all the land is taken and most of the land that they, they do with Required to develop because they just go straight up. So I definitely think there's a lot of opportunity in figuring out the right. If you're in those rural markets and you have some land opportunity, I think looking into single family rentals and finding out the developers that are actually spending the time, energy, and effort to do so would be a great option to look into. Yeah, no, 100%. And, and to your point with regarding the development side, so there's like different tiers of developers that they pay more for land. So the, the lowest form not necessarily the lowest form of developer but the developer that was going to pay the least amount for a land is typically going to be your big box developers that are going to be like the pulties of the world that are doing these massive you know residential developments house. and just you know doing cookie cutter homes and selling them off then you've got your build to rent developers they're typically going to pay more than you know the cookie cutter uh, developers like the pulties etc and then you've got the apartment developers are going to pay the most because they can get you know, more density, you know, oftentimes with these residential air apartment buildings, there's a lot of contention, uh, depending on where they're located in town. Not everyone likes, likes to see apartments go up so they can be a little bit more contentious of a plan to get through as far as development. So oftentimes, if you have two offers and you say, okay, well, one's an apartment developer, maybe they can pay a little bit more, but the process of getting to the finish line is going to be a lot harder than maybe going along with this build to rent community. It gives you that flexibility to know that you maybe have a little bit more security with one offer versus another. And that's going to be very crucial, especially if you start from an investment standpoint, if I'm acquiring land and parceling it off and I can flip it to a build to rent developer versus a Pulte or some of these other apartment developers, maybe that just gives you another avenue to explore uh, for you know potential end buyer. For what you what you need so yeah yeah and also like some townships like you had mentioned you know sometimes they just want homes you know you have a big tract of land and they just desperately want houses to be built they don't want apartments and you just have to abide by their specifics and uh you know a lot of people are just like oh well you know i could build several hundred homes here so i'm going to call up a lennar toll or pulte on re not realizing that the, you actually can make substantially more money if you go the build to rent route next up is northeast found to hold highest apartment rent premiums as sunbelt offers discounts yeah i, th I, I thought this was interesting you know obviously as a you know a northeastern at heart here, you know, I thought this was actually quite fascinating. And I do believe this actually has to do with the fact that income, and again, this is just my two cents, income, and I'm curious to understand why, like what they what they really believe this is due to, but uh, at least from what I was understanding, they didn't have much explanation as to why other than my assumptions to be you know, Manhattan, Connecticut, you know, New Jersey seeing the same thing, Massachusetts seeing the same thing, you know, seeing massive increases in rent because there's, you know, just these are higher income areas. You know, most people are, you know, uh, they're not drastically affected, right, as much as the rest of the world is. You know, you know, Beverly Hills individuals are not worried, about, as an example, are not worried about, you know, the values of rent or um, it's not, it's not, um, Shocking, right? And most overpriced, underpriced multifamily market. So like, this is just showing you like, you know, people are going to pay a premium because they want to be in, you know, New Haven, Connecticut. They want to be in Manhattan. They want to be, you know, in these class A markets and where you have places like hypothetically in Austin, Texas. In Austin, Texas, they also have like the most amount, I, I, I don't remember the exact figures, but the amount of development that has occurred in Austin, Texas is insane. And they have um, so much inventory. So it's like, you know, you have so much product that's on the market 
and not enough people filling these apartments at fantastic rents. You know, you have drastic vacancies. It's the same thing in even, um, uh, you know, places like Miami. The only reason why Miami markets, they will continue to go up is because it's such, it's, you know, there's just so many freaking people moving here every day. Even though they have such an abundance of supply here, they, no one seems to care. They'll still pay. They'll still pay five caps. It makes no sense to me. Yeah, and I mean, obviously, the people that are moving there are coming to to secure higher paying jobs, and so the you know what they can pay in rent often oftentimes is is competitive. Uh, now, to your point regarding some of these locations, I was actually kind of surprised Madison, Wisconsin. I'm not too familiar with that market per se, yeah. but. You know, out of the ones that you've seen, you know, obviously the Northeast, you, you know, the New Haven, Connecticut's the Hartford. I, I could see that. Obviously, it's a very densely populated area. You know, Massachusetts, obviously New York City, you know, depending on which borough you're targeting. Obviously, I could see that being the case. I had some friends, you know, post COVID that they got like killer deals on the rent. They got, you know, obviously got a couple months of free rent. They had a reduced rent compared to what they were paying before. And now it's become super competitive. And I think one of our one of my friends, his sister lives in New York City and her lease before was like 4,200 a month and then they bumped it up to like 5,000, like 1,200 bucks essentially raised their rent uh, in one year and they they try to negotiate and they uh, the landlord's like, no, we, we have like another person ready in line to to come in. So some of these numbers don't necessarily surprise me. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I get to your point. I think what it comes down to is that it doesn't matter where you invest in the country. Obviously, it's important to invest in areas that you know that there's going to be growth long term, as, as we say, a rising tide lifts all boats. But that's why I think it's so important to get really granular and understanding the, lo the, the, the nuances of your local market so you can make better decisions in the long run. Uh, because yeah, again, sure. there's going to be fluctuations in pricing in every single market. So you really just have to make sure that you understand more of the di the local dynamics to ensure you're not going to get in over your head because you read in the newspaper that, oh, yeah, like, you know, Miami real estate is the next best thing since sliced bread without understanding like the nuances of the area. So you could make best the best decision possible and you could yeah. trans transmute not necessarily just Miami. It could be Austin, Texas, Phoenix, whatever, whatever. I, I also I also think there's a lot of value in like, looking at these areas like I like buying existing product not class A product, not stuff that was built within three years. I like buying stuff that is built in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, whatever. And I can rent, come in and renovate the product. But that, that market is so proven in itself. It's like Northern New Jersey has like, as an example, because it's my backyard, there's just so many freaking people moving there all the freaking time because they come from New York. There's such a huge population. There's such a demand for more product that I don't know when they're going to catch up to it. And it's funny because like, if people don't know, if you buy too far South in New Jersey, you definitely will have a drastic difference in return metrics. So mm -hmm. you can't pay anywhere near but if you don't know these areas, they got huge investors that are buying for, you know, like these, you know, these in, um, that I, I was just doing some research on an industrial building and one and, and some fund paid 400 plus dollars a square foot for an industrial building in a market where it probably should have traded for maybe 250, maybe 280 at most. And they paid 420. And this was an air uh, fund based out of Chicago buying a huge, you know, hundred plus thousand square foot industrial building in Jersey. I'm like, these people have no idea why I'm planning. I have like, unless they know something I don't from being in this marketplace, which I, I honestly cannot make sense of how on planet earth they spent that much money. I told my sales guys, like, you should call them and sell them every damn building we've ever found in this, in this area, because who the heck is He's paying four hundred dollars a foot, unbelievable. So it's like these are people from outside the areas. Like if I was going to invest in Austin, Texas, and I go, oh, I can find a seven cap, and maybe I can make it to an eight. You know, I'm thinking that might be a decent idea, but there's just so much freaking product on the market. You know, like you're gonna have, you're gonna struggle. Like here in Miami, I would never buy something here in Miami. There's just too much product. They're building another fifty thousand apartments. It's like how on planet Earth? Like, I think there, we're, we have a huge lag time till that, that we're ever going to catch up. And obviously, like there's still so many of these places you see in Miami. I, I don't know if it's like a, I don't know if it's like a, you know, one of those weird, never-ending, constantly growing markets. But in Miami, rent growth has gone down, but the sales growth hasn't stopped. If you bu just buy some land in Brickell, and you'll be good, right? <laughs> yeah, you You're can just be. Right what's now. his name? Uh, uh, what's what's the hedge fund managers for Citadel? Oh, uh, yeah, I know, I know who you, exactly you were talking about. Ken, uh, Ken Griffin, Citadel, Citadel yeah. guy, Rob Griffin. This guy spent seven hundred million dollars on three lots 
here in Brickell. I mean, I, apparently they're going to be building, you know, mass. I mean, you pay $350 million for a piece of dirt, two acres right on the water in Brickell. I mean, clearly mm -hmm. he knows better than us, but betting obviously may, very, very long term. He'll be into that building for a billion dollars, no problem. Well, I guess when you're worth $50 billion, it's $700 million maybe isn't that. <laughs> Drop in the bucket. Drop in the bucket. Next up is developer purchases half of Oakland A's stadium plans a $5 billion redevelopment. So I'm not, I'm not sure if you had a chance to get over to San Francisco and particularly the Oakland area. I actually was just out there visiting a good buddy of mine uh, a few a weeks minute. ago. It's been a minute, but my fiance is uh, from about an hour south of there. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's a cool area. I actually got a chance to see the A's play uh, when we went and visited. I'm a big, I'm not necessarily a big baseball fan. Like I don't follow along per se, but I do out. Of, I like to go to the game sometimes, especially if we're in a in an area where, they have a historical stadium and stuff like that. So got a chance to actually go see the O's, A's play uh, the Marlins uh, at uh, the stadium. So this stadium has kind of been dilapidated for quite some time. It was built, I believe, in this, the late 60s, early 70s. It uh, hasn't really been kept up with. The, o, the A's are actually going to be leaving at the end of this season and going down to Sacramento for two years or three years before they head over to uh, Las Vegas. I believe they're going to, uh, you know, they're trying to build a stadium for them out in Las Vegas. So th in this particular area, you have the Oakland A stadium. And then right next to it, there was a stadium that the Golden State Warriors used to play at before they moved into the city to a brand new, really nice stadium on the water. So this has kind of become, this has historically been like kind of a sporting complex. And this uh, development group, African American Sports and Entertainment Group, bought half of the, the site from the Oakland A's owner, who also happens to own the 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 the, the site where the stadium was located, the, the 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 Golden State Warriors, and they're trying to acquire the remaining half of the 112 acre property, and they're proposing a massive development uh, that would incorporate a variety of different mixed use, so residential, commercial, entertainment, hospitality. And then they're also working out deals with uh, United Soccer League. There's Oakland Roots that that's there. Uh, they also have are making a play to try to get a WNBA franchise. And then obviously, if they're able to build a new stadium, maybe they could qualify for an NFL expansion team. Obviously, that 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 system's been proven in that market. So they could very well be in contention for that as well. So I just wanted to share this article because it kind of showcases the, the willingness and the city's working with them heavily. So there's they're actually trying to get uh, incentives for them to be able to produce to, to, to create this development. The, the actual site is actually in a really good spot. It's just off the highway. Great visibility. It could really be something cool. So, you know, it may or may not apply to you per se, but it's, st it's stuff like this that you, 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 you can see how, you know, making a statement or making a play at something, even if it's not to this scale, you can really make an impact in your city. And oftentimes, if it's a, if it's an impact that's in a positive direction for the city, the city may even consider working with you to try to get the project up and running. Because at the end of the day, this is going to become a tax juggernaut, most likely for them. In a variety yeah. of different ways. So, so I, I'm curious, right? Like, and, and again, if you guys are watching this, please, obviously, please comment down below. Why do you believe? Because I, it, it says here that the A's are not the first team to leave. Why are people leaving this area? Are they not have it? Like, you know, clearly, you know, it's not like the Yankee. You never hear like the Yankees are leaving Manhattan. You know, like you never hear or wherever they are, right? Like uh, with the Bronx, I forget where their stadium is, but like you're not you're not hearing that the Yankees are leaving their stadium. You're not hearing, you know, all these other, you know areas are leaving their stadiums but oh like this is not the first time a, a, um, a baseball team i believe has left this stadium i'm well, curious why that is it's the Ra the raiders left uh to go to las vegas so that was i believe one of the first teams that left then the golden state warriors left because they got a new stadium they're, they're literally you know this both those stadiums are older stadiums and you know the city of oakland just doesn't have the same amount of resources that san francisco does san francisco to their credit, was like, hey, come over here. We'll, we'll help build you a massive, really cool stadium on the water with good parking and access and everything. And so, you know, the Golden State Warriors took them up on it. So it's one of those things where they kind of just lured them across the river. And then the A's stadium, they've been trying to get the Oakland to help them build a new stadium for quite some time. You know, the owner really, I don't think, was committed to the area. I think he really wanted to get over to Las I mean, Vegas. Clearly Understandably, not. man, it's, it's just a bigger market. The inter It's the entertainment capital of the world. So there's a lot of, you know, gener revenue generating potential over there. So I don't think it necessarily has anything to do with Oakland as a whole. You know, obviously, they're just not a massive metro. I think overall, if you were just to look at Oakland, I think they have like half a million people that live there. Obviously, you can if you count surrounding areas, maybe a little bit more, but but it just doesn't have the same economic 
That makes sense. I mean, look, look, I mean, that, that makes sense to me. I mean, I just don't know why, like, why even try to build, I would just redevelop the whole thing. Like, stop, don't put yeah. a freaking stadium there. Get rid of the stadium. Yeah. They're, they're, they're going to, the, the goal is to scrap both stadiums completely. And then obviously focus, focus their attention on the mixed use side of things, build it into like an entertainment complex. And then they, they're trying to work out a deal with some form of entertainment because it'd be, it'd be, it would essentially become like a hub for people to come to from a variety of different places. And, yeah, you know, I get that. entertainment makes a difference. Like, like, uh, for sure. you know, stadiums make a difference. So I'd be curious what they really do believe the dirt's worth. I mean, obviously mm -hmm. they just paid 105 mil or something like that for the, for half the dirt. I'm curious what they, uh, so I guess they're valuing the dirt at around 200 something mil and interesting to see what they're going to be creating in that area. I mean, I wouldn't spend that much money on Oakland. I mean, Oakland's mm -hmm. been horrible for 40 years, you mm -hmm. know, 50 years. It's, um, it's been very rough. And I think, L I mean, California is just until the governor leaves, I wouldn't spend a damn dollar in California. I mean, I just think it is a silly state. I mean, I love California. I just, I love California. Uh, my sister lives out there. My fiance is from California. I've been out to California a hundred times. I love the, I love the state. I do not like the politics there. And I think they're absolutely destroying it from the inside out. Once we have new, new governance and people who actually want to uh, have people thrive in California, I would love to invest more money there. I just think it's very interesting how people continuously look like this is a, someone's going to spend $5 billion redeveloping Oakland. That is a visionary if I've ever heard of one. Um, well, and, there, and there's parts of Oakland because obviously I had a chance to stay there. One of my buddies bought a, bought a duplex. He's he works at Apple, so he bought a duplex in in Oakland. He lives in one of them, rents out the others as an Airbnb. And so I got the chance to really go around Oakland and see. And you know, obviously it gets, it gets a lot of spillover from San Francisco. So there's sections oh, for sure of it does. Oakland for sure. that that are literally brand new, like they look very high end and everything else. But to your point, there's definitely parts of Oakland that have been underinvested in for quite some time. Luckily, they do have some pretty great universities. Berkeley is right around the corner, one of the top engineering schools in the world. So they get a lot. They have a lot of feeders into you know different technology companies in San Francisco. I just so. don't know how long it's going to be to let whole that whole area changes. I mean, you definitely, I'm hundred yeah. percent. You have pockets. I mean, California is weird with pockets. It's like some area you could be you could be um, in L.A. I mean, I don't know how many times you've been to L.A., but have, yeah. in L.A. you can go. Two blocks in one direction, and it be it's night and freaking day. DC is the same. I mean, I, oh yeah, yeah. There, there there'd be set times where I got off the the the, the metro and then went the wrong way, and yeah. I walked and for two like, blocks. And I'm looking around. I'm like, oh, <laughs> I'm definitely not supposed to be here. Very interesting markets like that. I'm I'm mean, interested to see what they do. I'm I'm curious. Next up is navigating the stagflation, undercutting commercial property values. Yeah. So I mean, we've had you know Jamie Dimon. This you know this head of banking this guy from hedge fund, hedge fund this guy whatever a bunch of huge economic players i keep talking about stagflation stagflation has been thrown around i know ray dalio has talked about stagflation a bunch of times we're in the midst of it right like this is this is where you know we're seeing a lot of pressure downward pressure because of rates being increased on property values right like property values are really being compressed as you can see here there has been many times where you know you have these pockets where wealth is created and wealth as wealth opportunities are here, right? Obviously, you can if you scroll down just a smidge because I want to be able to I want to see the time frame. Okay, yeah, yeah, perfect. That's that's what I wanted to see. Okay, cool. So this is you know this just shows you the ten year Treasury yield, and this is equity in the same store net income growth, right? So obviously, this is showing you that like obviously NOIs are dropping drastically because of how expensive things are getting. And obviously this just gives you guys the opportunity where, you know, these major investment funds, like this is why there's so much cash sitting on the sidelines, right? If you're wondering why there's cash sitting on the sidelines, because the 10 year treasury, you literally have substantial upside where you're, I mean, not, I wouldn't say upside, sorry. You have substantial returns in difference to commercial real estate, where in a lot of these deals, it's very tight. They're not making, they might as well just leave their money in a 10 year treasury, collect nearly 5% on their money, which by the way, I mean, you know, the treasury has just been hovering in the, you know, the mid to high fours for a long time. You know, it's been in this, you know, in this, if you see here, the 2022, 2023, 2024 now uh it's been hovering in this range for quite some time i don't think we're going to see it just drastically come down for for a while i mean look if you look mm -hmm. at since 2001 we were actually literally almost at the same place it was in 2001 which is shocking you know it, it actually hasn't touched and then i mean think about it people got so freaking comfortable in this market in the commercial real estate world from 2011 till 20 you know even until about a year ago year or so ago people just got so freaking comfortable with how good the market has been. I mean, it's just been straight up 
since 2011 and a lot of growth and opportunities there. What I think is possible here and what's what's the what positives to look out for are if you're in this market and you can make great money now and you can find good opportunities right now and you can be getting into these deals at a great basis at a great cap rate with value add components where you're buying it at an eight, nine or 10 cap and you can bring it to a nine, 10 or 11 or 12 cap. And you can ride out this wave and you can cash flow nicely. And when interest rates come down to like 5% or so, which they will, you're going to be in a fantastic position. This is where wealth is created. These cycles right now, right? Like this is the opportunity right now where I'm raising a bunch of money. I'm trying to find the best deals possible. I want to be invested in as many deals as possible because if you can find great deals today, that cash flow day one with good upside right? Like this is where wealth is created, right? In the last, call it three or four years, right? You see into 2020, 2021, even early 2022, that's where um, you can actually clearly see people got greedy, where people are greedy. And like in these cycles, people got greedy, where you see the all equity, same store NOI growth skyrocketed. And now they're all in trouble because they can't refi and values have gone down. When this is, these are opportunities now where, hey, we're actually going like, look at all the crossovers. Like this is what that's interesting. Like the crossovers were in 2007 and then again in 2011. These crossovers where the red line, the treasury yield goes above the, you know, the same sort of NOI growth. I think that these are opportunities. Like if you started buying in 2011, I think you, you know, you would have made a ton of money if you held for the next 10 years. If you bought, if you bought in 2000, let's see, right after 2007, after the market crash, I mean, like, you know, I look at it, let's see here. If you, uh, I'm going to start going through these. In 2001, if you would have bought right here, you would have done very well over the next five or so years, five, six years, major growth. 2011, you would have had major growth. Obviously in 2007, I mean, things just took a tumble because of, you know, uh, unre- you know, no regulation. But in 2011, you would have made major money. In 2020, I think people, you know, they, they went the wrong way. I think that if you bought in 2020, you know, this is where you get hurt, right? 2021, this is where you get hurt. I think this is a great time where if you got in now, I would definitely say this is the time to buy. Hold for the next five to 10 years, buy great assets, great cash flow. This is where people, if you can make great money in this market right now, you will be thriving in the next decade as interest rates start to cool off. To your point regarding the the troths and, and the cycle, like, you know, take a look at this, guys. It's not, there's a lot of people out there that are like, oh, rates are going to come down and it's going to be great come 2025. I'm of the mindset it, it likely won't. I mean, we're going to likely be in a I period agree. similar to this for quite some time. So it may be a two, three year window that you're having to navigate this. So for those of you guys who are kind of sitting on your hands and saying, you know, it'll be better in 25, like this is, this is kind of the new norm is, is kind of what I'm seeing it being. And so Correct. hopefully this takes gives you a kick in the butt if, if it's if it's something that you know you need, or it kind of gives you some perspective and understanding that regardless of the environment, if you're operating in the space, it all it takes is you continuing to push forward and try to, like Henry said, buy properties, uh, contact individuals to try to generate new opportunities, but really just putting the, the the nose to the grindstone because these are the times, the periods of times where I'd be interested to see like the the, the drop off. So, you know, if, if, if you had, let's call it from an agent standpoint, the number of licensed agents in this environment versus those that once that the, the, the the period of time expired, how many were left afterwards? Like there's a delta that was created. I would assume the same thing would go for for investors, like value add investors during this period of time a lot of them wash out because they're just not, uh, you know, they, they don't stick, they don't stick to the the fundamentals and they really focus on trying to identify new opportunities that are going to be beneficial. And so if you have that mindset and you're willing to put your nose to the grindstone for the next few years, it could really pay dividends uh, in a relatively short period of time. So like, the, the, you know, I, I've been telling people for a while, you need to be planning for this to be the new normal. Mm-hmm. Like if you need to be acting, working, like this is going to be the new normal for the foreseeable future. This is going to be how it is for the next three, five, 10 years. And if you have that kind of mindset, if and when things get better, you're going to be thriving. 100%. You know, so many people are just waiting. You know? Yeah, that, that's the thing I don't get. Like there's a lot of people out there. It's like, oh, you know, I think I'll, you know, and again, I, I don't know why, but it's like, they'll think, oh yeah, 2025 will be better. Like survive till 25 is some, a lot of what, what a lot of people say nowadays in the brokerage community. And I'm just like, it's like, why don't you just thrive in 24? Like just focus on trying to execute today. So you don't have to worry or so you don't have to kind of try to hit the ground running in the future that you can't predict anyways. Like we could be in this scenario until 2026, 2027. So does that mean over the next three years, you're just going to sit on your hands? Like that doesn't, no sense. that's not a proactive, like as a business I've never owner, said ever, that's not a, that's not a, that's not a winning business strategy, you know? 
for sure. I've never said I wanted to survive. That's good, man. Well, I, I, I would assume you've, you've long since survived, and hopefully now you focus on thriving, which is what for, you should be for sure. focused I, on. So. Take survive, take barely survive out of your vocabulary. All right, so single tenant net lease still positioned for performance. So for the, just to just to describe what single tenant net lease is for those individuals who are listening that maybe don't know, the, these are typically the you know, standalone retail, or sometimes there'll be industrial buildings. But for the most part, you typically see it in the retail space where you'll have like the Walgreens or the fast casual restaurants where they're nationally uh, corporately backed leases 20 years oftentimes or more uh, once you include all the options. So they're they're typically traded on the market is, is what people, the, the brokers that advertise it, they say it's like buying a bond, right? But, you know, in reality, there's a lot of more nuance to it and you have to really analyze the underlying financials of the, the investment. But for the most part, these types of investments attract people who don't really want to deal with any toilets or anything like that. They just buy it, set it and forget it type of investment. And they're very, very popular amongst people kind of going into retirement. It's just a, kind of another way to diversify their their investment portfolio. And so one of the things that they kind of highlighted here was that as of March, uh, the number of major U.S. markets with sub 4% single tenant vacancy matched the count from the same period five years ago. What that means is that the, the market vacancy for these types of opportunities is almost the same as it was back in 2019 when, again, we were, we were still at a very... Uh, and it's still a very favorable uh, environment. Retail spending is obviously still higher. You know, we could we could debate all day long about whether or not that's just rat inflated. I think it probably is. There's a lot of people out there spending money on credit cards that they may or may not have. But obviously, that still translates to spending in the economy. So a lot of these retailers are still doing very well. One of the characteristics of these investments, as they said before, that that makes them attractive is they typically trade between one million and ten million dollars, which is you know accessible for a lot of private investors. So as we said before it's not uncommon i've got a couple of clients that i helped i sold in this just this year i sold three single tenant at least properties one of them was a business owner friend of mine who i've sold several properties to in the past and he just buys these properties up pays them off and lets them set it set it and forget it another buddy of mine owned a business sold it in the past he's all he's a, also a developer out in newton nebraska he helped, i helped him buy a pizza hut deal triple net 10 year lease, et cetera. Um, and, and again, the, these are the types of people that, that often end up buying these types of properties. And, and granted, you can get some institutional players in, involved in that that range, but most of the time they're going to be buying a lot bigger properties. So anyway, so th this is just uh, some perspective to share that, you know, there are still sectors of the marketplace that are performing at a high level. And it seems that the, the highest performing ones in particular in this in the single tenant at least space is fast food, convenience stores, restaurants are all performing really well and and i guess their vacancy rates are sub three percent so it's kind of crazy yeah i think that like look i love triple net deals um in the right circumstances you know why i like them because i like finding these negotiating great triple net deals and then selling them off where if you can find these i like flip like i feel like flipping these types of properties right because if you have a great buyer on the back end who will buy it at an x cap rate you can lock them up at at a substantially below that kind of cap rate or i guess substantially above it you can make some great money i mean these are these are opportunities where i think they're great for 1031 clients i think they're great for retirees these are fantastic options for them to sell their you know get them to sell their current property get them to you know get out of those properties get them for good prices and then flip it into a, a triple net and keep in mind guys like i look at triple net from the lens of an investor first like or even as a wholesale deal right if you can find these types of deals and lock them up at eights and sell them at sevens or six and a halves or sixes, there's a lot of money to be made, right? And I think that, you know, keeping in mind that like, hey, you know, it's not just about listing these properties. There's a lot of value in thinking a little bit more creatively and locking them up. Um, I try to do a lot of leasebacks to try to set up triple net deals where you have single tenant uh, single tenant, industrial, single tenant, retail, where they're owner occupants. So they're going to sell it and then do a lease back. Definitely an amazing way, like I'm working on run one right now, which I'm waiting to hear back on. I should hear back on hopefully the first of June, but I should be buying it at a day one 12 cap uh, awesome. in my, in my market. So like the, the, the goal is that we'll lock it up and then I'll sell it, you know, probably within, you know, uh, you know, either same day as a wholesale deal at an eight cap or I'll buy it, lock it up, sign a long-term lease, hold it for the long term and refi and hold it cash free. Anyways, it's just those types of opportunities are massive. You just got to see them like a little bit differently than the masses. Yeah, 100%. And and really, there's a lot of investors out there nowadays, you know, they don't necessarily want the 20 year lease. They'll start looking at these properties that have like two years of term left or a year of term left. And maybe that market has a sub 3% vacancy rate, which means that they get either A, if once that lease 
expires, they can go back to the tenant and say, hey, we're going to jack your rent up 30% because that's what the market is. And if they decide to, to leave or, or they don't want to renew, then that gives you an opportunity to try to bring the mark, uh, bring the the property back up to what market rate is at that point in time as well. So, you know, that's one that's one thing we're doing with uh, with a client of mine right now is we're trying to find properties in that in that category. We had one under contract. Unfortunately, we weren't able to kind of make the timing work on it that they needed a much qu quicker timeline than we were able to do, but um but again, that that those types of opportunities are out there and if you're willing to capitalize on them, it could be a pretty beneficial one to pursue. So, for for sure, for sure. I mean, look, and they and they're great. And if you have a buyer who likes them, that's a great buyer. That's a fantastic mm -hmm. buyer. All right. So one last one uh, that I'll share here, um, kind of just adding to the um, general discussion is related to the immigration clouds. Uh, so understanding the different generations and, and, and how those trends could affect the future of real estate. So... Uh, you know, obviously, correct me if I'm wrong, Henry, but I believe you and I both belong to the millennial generation, um, which makes up roughly 21.7% of the the population. What's interesting about the millennials, which I didn't really understand, didn't know, um, is I guess they have the second highest birth rate in American history. So if I'm not mistaken, oh, the second highest birth rate. Maybe I misinterpreted that. I don't know if that means like we were the generation that had, if you compare the total size to baby boomers, I think we are the second largest of, of of all time when it comes to the US. Now, with Gen Z, which is the next generation after us, you know, they were they were kind of describing them as a smaller piece of the, the the total population and because of that, it's affecting, you know, a variety of different industries. Obviously, less people are deciding to go to college for obvious reasons, the biggest being the cost of education and the lack of, uh, you know, opportunities thereafter. So just trying to see and drop in enrollments. And so again, it just, I think what, what the reason I wanted to share this, and it doesn't necessarily have a ton of information, but at least gives you, gets you thinking about how different demographics impact different industries and how is that going to translate to all different types of businesses going forward, whether it's housing, consumer goods, jobs, et cetera. That's why looking at some of this information, especially if you're starting to invest in different markets and getting an understanding of the trends in different demographics is important. So thought I'd share that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I love reading this type of stuff. And I also think I like the migration patterns. I think it's really important to be paying attention to where money is being poured into where, you know, like I like to follow trends. Like there's a lot of value and understanding like listen great to understand your local market great to understand one asset class but like in this type of economy where you need to be nimble where you need to be on your toes both technologically because with chat gpt and like ai coming through as well as um economically asset classes go through these cycles right technology is going through another cycle right now and if you just act like you can focus on one asset class and one little marketplace and or one type of technology you're going to be left behind and these are constant reminders like hey find out where the money's being poured into what asset classes what locations who's your buyer because there's going to be cycles of buyers being like uh, you know in the next 20 years the main buyers are not going to be the main in your marketplace i'm saying you know not talking about blackstones and vanguards and whoever in your marketplace there's gonna be a different clientele who's gonna be buying those properties right like the the people who are the big players right now are probably not gonna be the big players in 20 years and you need to be constantly paying attention to those cycles of who those players are um where they're coming from what areas are investing in, in your local markets and capitalizing where you can no i couldn't agree more but i appreciate the conversation i think i think you know we've gone through several different articles that i think were very pertinent and hopefully you guys gain some value from this discussion if you guys watch this after us recording obviously we want to still get your feedback so if you Feel free to type away. We do re review all the comments and everything that we receive.